Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining the Wisconsin Farmers Union Fair Maps Town Hall. My name is Bobby Wilson and I will be moderating this evening. I'm also joined by Tommy Enright from Wisconsin Farmers Union, Rachel Henderson, who is the president of our Dunn County chapter, as well as our guest speaker, Matt Rothschild from the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. So as folks are getting settled in, I have a couple of notes on the technology. Looks like everyone very quickly found the chat box. Um, so as Tommy mentioned, all attendees will be muted and videos will be turned off throughout the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, you can type them into the Q&A box, which is located on the panel at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to ask questions anytime and we will answer them after we hear from our guest speaker. Uh, so we hope that all the technology works properly, but in case anyone has a poor internet connection or if there are any issues with video quality, Keep in mind that this is being recorded and we will send you a link to watch the recording afterwards. Um, so we have a great program planned for you this evening and in just a few minutes we will debut our short Fair Maps video and then we'll hear some remarks from our guest speaker Matt Rothschild followed by a Q&A session and we will conclude this event with a call to action so you all know how you can get involved to get fair nonpartisan district maps in Wisconsin. So before we dive in, I do want to share a little bit about why we as a family farm organization care about fair maps. It's pretty simple. We care about fair maps because we care about democracy. As a grassroots organization, democracy is built into everything we do. Uh, the issues that we work on come directly from our members who introduce, debate, and vote on our policies each year at our convention. We also believe that civic engagement is vital to democracy, so we work really hard to provide opportunities for our members to weigh in with lawmakers all throughout the year. But in order for any of that work to really matter, we need democracy to work. And democracy only works when the rules are fair and when people have true representation. It does not work when the system is skewed in favor of one political party or another. And it's very difficult for anyone to participate in the democratic process when we know that our votes and our viewpoints don't matter as much as they should. So for us, when we bring 100 farmers to the Capitol for our annual lobby day, or when we testify at public hearings on clean water, we need to know that our collective voice is represented. And that's why we see fair maps as really a, a bedrock issue that impacts our ability to meaningfully engage on all of the other issues we care about, from climate change to rural broadband to whole milk in schools. So I'm so glad that you're all with us tonight to learn more about nonpartisan redistricting and how we can seize this opportunity to reclaim our democracy in Wisconsin. And with that, I will pass it over to Tommy Enright to introduce our Fair Maps video. Hi everyone, I'm Tommy Enright. I am the Communications and Special Projects Coordinator here at Wisconsin Farmers Union. If you subscribe to our e-newsletter, um, or if you're a member, then you probably get emails from me from time to time. But another thing that I get to do is oversee the production of videos like this one that you're about to see and the Monopoly Power in Our Food System video that we did back in April. And that Monopoly Power in Food System video and the webinar that we did similar to this are both still available on our YouTube channel. So please go check them out if you haven't yet. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our videographer, Louis Fisher. Uh, he's a friend of Wisconsin Farmers Union. He grew up in the greater Farmers Union family and he's worked with us on various projects throughout the years. Um, most recently, he did the National Farmers Union Farm Aid video campaign. And that included some short videos like the one you're about to see tonight. So this issue, Fair Maps, gerrymandering, nonpartisan redistricting, this has been a policy priority for Wisconsin Farmers Union since 2013. So it's not always top of mind for voters. In fact, I only learned about this issue when I attended a Farmers Union event back in 2015. Um, but it was a special order of business for six years and it remains one of our top policy priorities to the extent that it was one of the things that we brought to the Capitol last year or th earlier this year in January for our Farm and Rural Lobby Day. Uh, as Bobby said, our ability to effectively advocate depends on fair representation. So that's why we keep bringing this up. Um, as far as this project goes, we wanted to create a short digestible video that could lay the groundwork for the issue and that people could share widely without losing people's attention. 
because it is so important and we need to get it out there as much as possible. Um, we'll be posting this to our Farmers Union or Wisconsin Farmers Union YouTube channel as well as the Fair Maps page on our website. You can find it at wisconsinfarmersunion.com slash fair maps. So if there are any technical issues right now, uh, you know, rural broadband during a storm, um, you'll be able to catch the video later. And we're also recording this webinar, so that'll be avail available for future viewing as well. So with that, here is the premiere of our Fair Maps video, we, and we hope you enjoy it. Over the last several years, Wisconsin has repeatedly made national news for having some of the most gerrymandered maps in the nation. Let's take a look at what that means. State lawmakers represent the people who reside in a defined area called the Legislative District. Wisconsin's legislative districts, created by the majority party in the legislature in 2011, were found by federal courts in November 2016 and in January 2017 to be an unconstitutional political gerrymander that unfairly dilutes the votes of over half the state's citizens in violation of both the First and the Fourteenth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution. The current partisan map was purposely drawn to favor one political party. Using computer modeling and sophisticated data algorithms, legislators in the majority party pack voters of the opposing party into as few districts as possible. So the minority wins big in those districts, but doesn't win many overall. On top of creating some oddly shaped districts, this also sets the stage for extreme partisanship. Elected officials don't hear from constituents with other points of view because they've all been drawn into other districts. In fact, the districts have been drawn to so heavily favor the incumbent that new candidates don't even bother to run for office. In 2016, 38 of 99 state assembly candidates ran unopposed in the general election. For democracy to thrive, we need competitive legislative districts and real elections. Not only does partisan gerrymandering poison our democracy, it's expensive, and Wisconsin taxpayers are footing the bill. Rather than drawing fair, nonpartisan districts, Wisconsin has spent over $4 million to defend the current gerrymandered maps. Tax dollars should be used for public needs like roads, schools, and infrastructure, not to defend political battles the majority of citizens do not support. So how do we, the voters, get better district maps? Luckily, other states, like Iowa, have created laws and the computer software to draw legislative districts based on nonpartisan factors, such as population, county and town borders, and contiguity of land area. The Wisconsin legislature will draw new districts in 2021, so we need to make sure that the problem of gerrymandering in Wisconsin gets better, not worse. As voters, we must assert our rights. Here's what you can do. One, voice your support for the state to implement a nonpartisan redistricting commission on social media and to your legislators. Two, help pass a resolution or referendum in your county to support nonpartisan redistricting. Wisconsin Farmers Union can help provide the tools and resources you need to make it happen. Three, call your legislators and ask them to support nonpartisan redistricting. And if they don't, vote them out. Elected officials who don't believe in fair democracy have no business representing their constituents. This isn't a partisan issue. Rigging maps is wrong, whether it's Republicans or Democrats who are doing it, and there have been instances of both across the nation. The majority of counties in Wisconsin have already passed advisory resolutions in favor of nonpartisan redistricting. Voters, no matter their politics, want fair maps. Citizens should be choosing their representatives, not the other way around. For more information on how gerrymandering affects you, visit wisconsinfarmersunion.com. All right, so we hope you enjoyed that and we'll be emailing a link to the video to everyone who registered for this event and my colleague Bobby will be going over some more action items or action steps in detail at the end of this meeting. But first, I'd like to introduce a good friend of WFU, Matt Rothschild. Matt is the executive director of Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, where he's been since 2015. He testifies at the state capitol. He appears on many Wisconsin radio stations and his op-eds are published regularly in the Cap Times, Urban Milwaukee, and the Wisconsin Examiner. And before COVID, he was driving all over the state giving talks on banning gerrymandering. And so in fact, Matt spoke to our citizen lobbyists at our Farm and Rural Lobby Day last January, which seems like 
a year ago. Uh, he just finished writing a new book, 12 Ways to Make Wisconsin's Democracy Work Better. And before coming to Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, Matt worked for 32 years at the Progressive Magazine in Madison, most of the time as the editor and publisher. So Matt will be telling us a little bit more about this issue, and then we'll be taking questions from you all using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So with that, here's Matt Rothschild. Thanks, Tommy. And that was a tremendous video. You all have done a terrific job on that video, and I hope it gets spread around the state far and wide and people watch it and, and start to take action because that's what we need. I also want to thank the Wisconsin Farmers Union for throwing your weight behind this crucial pro-democracy issue, banning gerrymandering. I know you've been at it for many years, as we have at the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign and other groups like the League of Women Voters and Common Cause and Wisconsin Voices have too. It's a great coalition working on this issue. And let me just say at the outset uh, that I'm grateful for everyone who's tuning in and I hope you enjoy my little talk and I look forward to answering your questions. As the video said, uh, you know, gerrymandering uh, is wrong whether it's Democrats doing it or Republicans doing it. And uh, the Democrats actually could have solved this problem themselves back in 2009 when they had uh, Governor Jim Doyle, a Democrat in the governor's mansion, and uh, Democrats in control of the state assembly and the state senate. Actually, there was a bill that Demo some Democrats had proposed to ban gerrymandering back at that point, and uh, it actually had a hearing, but Democratic leadership didn't want to bring it to a vote. Why? Because power is the most intoxicating drug there is on the market, and Democrats were drunk with their power. And they thought, like most people who have power, that they're going to have power for a long time. Actually, they thought they were going to win the election in 2010, uh, control of the governorship and the state legislature again, so they could rig the maps in favor of Democrats. I mean, crassly, that was the thinking. Well, it didn't turn out that way, did it? Uh, Scott Walker won the governorship. Republicans swept the state assembly and the state senate. And they wasted no time at all in going about rigging the maps in favor of Republicans. What they actually did was they hired a political scientist from Oklahoma, of all places, to come to Madison with this fancy computer uh, software about how you uh, rig a district and set up shop not in the Capitol. They didn't do the people's business in the people's house. They went across the street to the glass bank in Madison in the, in the real cushy law office uh, of uh, Michael Best and Friedrich, and they set up shop in a room that became known as the map room. The map room was a locked room. Uh, you weren't allowed into the locked map room. The media wasn't allowed into the locked map room. Democrats weren't allowed into the locked map room. Even Republicans who weren't in leadership weren't allowed into the locked map room unless they got permission from the speaker or the two young male staffers who held the keys to the locked map room. And once they were allowed in, these Republican legislators could look only at their own redrawn districts. And before they could leave the locked map room, they had to sign an oath of secrecy. Now, that's not how the people's work should be done in a democracy. Actually, it's about 180 degrees from how the people's work should be done in a democracy. And what was going on in the locked map room? What was this Oklahoma political scientist doing in there with the speaker's uh, two young assistants? Well, they weren't content to draw one map. They actually drew nine maps, nine different incarnations of maps. Uh, with the same number of voters held constant, the same number of Democratic voters, the same number of Republican voters. And what they did was they moved a line here on the map or there on the map uh, to see how it would influence uh, the voting uh, results. And with each successive map, they called them aggressive map one or aggressive map two or aggressive map three, uh, they predicted a higher increase of Republicans uh, gaining seats in the state assembly. And uh, you know what? They knew what they were doing. Uh, because look what happened in November of 2018. After they ran through these map, uh, these uh, re this gerrymandering in 2011 with barely, you know, 10 days of discussion, they got what they wanted. In 2018, November 2018, Democrats statewide won 54% of all people voting in assembly races but Republicans won 63% of the seats in the state assembly, 63 seats out of the 99. So that's some pretty good rigging if you can get away with it. And the thing is, the Republicans uh, did get away with it. It looked like for a while though, that they weren't gonna get away with it because some Democratic voters ended up suing in federal court 
And as your video correctly pointed out, a three judge federal panel, two of those judges appointed by Republicans, ruled that this was one of the worst gerrymanders in modern American history and said it was unconstitutional, that this kind of hyper-partisan gerrymandering deprives people of their First Amendment rights to free speech and free assembly and equal protection under, law, under the law guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. It was a huge precedent. It went to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court punted on a technicality and sent it back to the federal court in Madison that was supposed to decide the case last July. But something happened in between, and that is that the U.S. Supreme Court took up two different gerrymandering cases and ruled on them at the same time last June. It was perfect time for the U.S. Supreme Court to strike down hyperpartisan gerrymandering because one of those cases was from Maryland where Democrats had grotesquely gerrymandered the districts when they had the power to do so. And the other was from North Carolina where Republicans did the same thing. And so what did uh, the U.S. Supreme Court do? Well, writing for the majority, Chief Justice Roberts said, actually this kind of hyperpartisan gerrymandering, this is a direct quote now, is incompatible with democratic principles. But then he added, and this is an indirect quote, go away, don't ever come back, we don't wanna hear from you ever again, every federal courthouse door is locked to anyone who wants to bring a case against hyperpartisan gerrymandering. He said this is beyond the reach of the federal judiciary and you gotta solve the problem at the state level. Well, that was a, an outrageous decision, number one, because once he, once he conceded that hyperpartisan gerrymandering is an offense to democratic principles and incompatible with democratic principles, he had an obligation as the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court to say it's unconstitutional like the federal judges did. And number two, he created a chicken and egg problem because if uh, there's gerrymandering in a state like Wisconsin and in other states, it's hard for the states to solve that problem when the elected officials who have rigged the maps are sitting there in power. Well, that has presented a problem for us. But you know what? There is this amazing grassroots movement in Wisconsin. The Wisconsin Farmers Union has helped to galvanize and some of the other organizations in the Wisconsin Fair Maps Coalition uh, have helped to galvanize. And a lot of it has just been spontaneous activism by uh, grassroots activists around the state who are just sick and tired of people in power manipulating things to serve themselves. And so what we've seen over the last five years or so is 51 counties out of the 72 in Wisconsin, 51 county boards passing resolutions urging the state legislature to ban gerrymandering and give us independent nonpartisan redistricting like they, they've got in Iowa. You know, Iowa invented the solution to this. And the so-called Iowa model, which has been working great for more than four decades, has career civil servants like our Legislative Reference Bureau drawing the maps, uh, and they uh, are forbidden from using political demographic data like that political scientists from Oklahoma used to rig the maps here in Wisconsin. They can't look at a district and say, how did this district vote? Or how did that district vote? Uh, and so that would help a lot because what uh, happened in 2011 was the Republicans, as your video showed, jammed as many Democrats into as few districts as possible. That was one technique. Or they splintered Democrats uh, uh, into rural areas from the towns that they were in when that was a close district. And if that town had just barely voted blue by splintering that town up, that town no longer had a blue representative. So those were the techniques they used. With the IO model, you can't use those techniques because you don't have that political demographic data. You're forbidden from using it. So that would be a huge improvement. And 51 county boards have passed those res uh, that resolution to tell the legislature, we got to get rid of gerrymandering. And you know they're not 51 blue counties uh, in Wisconsin. They're not 21 blue counties in Wisconsin. This is an issue that crosses partisan lines. People across the board are just sick and tired of the manipulation, we want a level playing field. And uh, uh, your video mentioned that uh, that poll that showed that 72% of Wisconsinites want to ban gerrymandering and give us nonpartisan independent redistricting. There are also two other interesting statistics in that poll, which was done by the Marquette Law School, by the way. One was that 63% of Republicans agree with that. 63% of Republicans and 76% of independents agree with that. So this really has super uh, popular support. Another indication of the popular support, 17 counties 
have passed referendums, non-binding advisory referendums, uh, and they passed overwhelmingly, 75, 80, 85 percent uh, in favor of giving us nonpartisan redistricting. And on November 3rd, there are going to be eight more counties that have these referendums, at least eight more counties. And those are Brown, Crawford, Door, Dunn, Iowa, Jefferson, Kenosha, and, and Rusk. There may be some additional counties that come on board because we've got activists working in a half dozen or more other counties to try to get uh, a referendum like that on the ballot. So that's, that's very exciting. Momentum is, uh, is on our side on this. Here's an example. In, in previous legislative sessions, including the last one, there's always been a bill introduced to ban gerrymandering in Wisconsin. And up until this last session, there'd only been one Republican co-sponsor, Todd Novak of Dodgeville. But right now, uh, in the last session, there were five Republican co-sponsors. Some of them spoke to your January lobbying day. I mean, it was not just Todd Novak who spoke, but Lauren Oldenburg was there. Uh, Travis Trannell was there. Uh, they both uh, co-sponsored the legislation. So is Go Joel Kitchens from Door County. And Jeff Mursaw from up north has also become a co-sponsor. And I just want to talk briefly about how Jeff Mursaw came around on this issue, because I think it's so telling. He was doing a weekly Facebook poll of his constituents. In one week, in October of 2019, he did a Facebook poll on nonpartisan redistricting. And lo and behold, the poll came back with 78% of his constituents in favor of it and only 6% opposed to it. And so uh, he looked at that data and looked at some of the comments he was getting and said, I'm going to co-sponsor. And that's how democracy is actually supposed to work. You know, you're supposed to respond to the wishes of your constituents. And I called his staff the next day and tried to set up an appointment to see him. And you know, when you call a legislator's office, the staff sometimes puts you off or says he's too busy or we'll give you to a scheduler and it'll be two weeks or four weeks or we'll get back to you later. Well, this was kind of funny because I called up and the woman, the nice young woman who answered the phone and said, Representative Mercer's office, can I help you? I said, yeah, Matt Rothschild from the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. I'd just like to set up an appointment with the representative to thank him for his vote on independent nonpartisan redistricting. And she said, well, he's right here. Why don't you talk to him yourself? So I just you know, talk to him right then and there and thank him for his, for his vote, which was a courageous vote because Robin Voss is against this. The leadership is against it. But we can't be con content with five, just five Republican co-sponsors. Uh, we should try for 25 in the next legislative session. We need to demand of anybody who's running for office, whether they're Democratic, Republican, or Independent, that they sign this candidate pledge that they will vote for a bill to ban gerrymandering in Wisconsin and give us independent nonpartisan redistricting like they've got in Iowa. And also, I want all of you to try to take that pledge that we saw on the video, the pledge that you as a voter will uh, pledge to vote only for candidates who agree to vote for nonpartisan redistricting. Call the candidates up. When the candidates are asking for your vote or they're you know, trying for some feedback on Facebook or some other forum, ask straight up, where do you stand on banning gerrymandering in Wisconsin? If they can't commit that they're going to vote for nonpartisan redistricting, tell them you're not going to vote for them and you're going to tell your friends and family not to vote for them. That's the only language they really understand. And that's how we're going to get this done. It's going to happen in the next uh, you know, two to four years. There's going to be so much pressure building from below that whoever is running for office or whoever is in office is going to have to respond to this increasingly loud uh, demand from the grassroots that we get nonpartisan redistricting in Wisconsin. And if they don't, everyone who is running for office is going to risk uh, losing their race. And that includes Robin Voss. They can't be assured of victory unless they come around on this issue. And that's the language that they'll understand. So let's keep building this pressure. I'm really excited about this town hall tonight. This is a crucial pro-democracy issue. Uh, as uh, Tommy said, I've written this book, 12 Ways to Make Wisconsin's Democracy Work Better. One of those ways is banning gerrymandering in Wisconsin. And it's just crucial to uh, having a democracy that functions properly. You know, as Fighting Bob LaFollette, uh, my patron saint said 100 years ago, the cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. We need to take that cure and apply that cure right here in Wisconsin in 2020 and get this done. So thanks very much. I look forward to your questions. 
All right, thanks so much, Matt. Every time I hear you speak, I, I learn a little bit more. So thank you so much for that presentation and that, that history of all the work that you've done over the years to ban gerrymandering and get fair maps in Wisconsin. Um, so I do see a few people with their hands raised. Just a reminder that, um, that we don't have a way to take you off of mute for this presentation. So if you do have a question, please use that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'd be happy to get your questions answered. Uh, so it looks like we have a few of them coming in already, um, and I will just take them in order. Um, so here's a question. Um, well, first, complimenting you on your presentation um, and uh, Matt, and also asking if you've seen a difference in the political climate uh, pre and mid pandemic times, um, and how has the problem of gerrymandering changed? I think uh, in this uh, time of the pandemic, uh, the problems of our democracy are, are being exposed as never before. Uh, the problem of racism in our democracy, the problem of uh, the unequal distribution of wealth and income in our democracy, the problem of our political system serving the elite and not serving uh, the vast majority of the people. And so people start asking themselves, why is that? Why is our democracy not working the way it's supposed to? And one of those reasons is money in politics, and one of those reasons is gerrymandering. And I think this is a, a, a ripe time for us to make the case even more strongly to ban gerrymandering because people understand that, you know, the democracy is malfunctioning. I mean, what the people want, the people aren't getting. Uh, and uh, I think that's why we're seeing more and more people coming around on this issue. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a question uh, from Calvin. Uh, Calvin wants to know, um, the Marathon County Board considers a fair maps resolution later this month. We need help with some of the conservative rural supervisors. Are there any resources tailored to help persuade those supervisors? Yes, we have a, a toolkit on our website at uh, wisdc.org, wisdc.org, uh, that's got a lot of helpful information. One thing uh, that uh, I like, one argument I like to make with more conservative board members and conservative voters for that matter, is that number one, it costs a lot. You made that point in the video, $4 million, that's a lot. And even in prior redistrictings, prior to 2010, which went into the uh, court system, it, it cost about $2 million. So we're throwing our money away down the tubes here for something that people don't want. The other one is, it's a real violation of local, con gerrymandering contributes to a violation of local control because uh, a lot of the elected officials in these gerrymandered districts have voted for more than 180 laws over the last eight in the eight years of, of Walker's rule that took away the power from local uh, government officials, took the power away from uh, county boards, you know, where you can, how you can control, uh, you know, factory farms, how you can control, you know, antennas and, and cell towers, uh, that all that was taken away. And so, uh, you know, a lot of conservatives believe and the Republican Party used to believe in local control, but doesn't believe in it now here in Wisconsin. And if you want to really get local control, you need to be able to elect people who respond to the local concerns. And when their district is safe, they don't have to. So I think those are two arguments, the money and the, the uh, taking away of local control. Yeah, those are, those are great arguments. Uh, moving on to another question. Can you elaborate on the concept of prison gerrymandering? Yeah, prison gerrymandering is another problem. It's one of those 12 that I talk about in this book I'm trying to get published and by UW Press, by the way. Prison gerrymandering is when someone who, say uh, you're a, a guy in Milwaukee and you commit a crime or you're convicted of a crime, whether you committed it or not. You are then sent to, uh, wa uh, to Wapan and you are counted in the census as living in Wapan, not living in Milwaukee. And so Wapan gets more representation because there are more people counted in the census as living in Wapan. And as a result, you get more resources go flow to, flow to Wapan. And Milwaukee is deprived of representation and resources as a result. So this is a real problem of democratic representation. And many states are moving uh, to curb it and Wisconsin needs to get on board that as well. There was legislation introduced in the last session that didn't go anywhere to uh, try to address this problem of prison gerrymandering. 
Yeah, and just to follow up to that, so it's is the is the solution to allow people who are incarcerated to still uh, be listed in the county in which they lived before they went to prison? And are there examples of other states doing that? Yeah, exactly. Count people where they're from. Because uh, the problem is, you know, the census comes down, you know, you're in Wapan, uh, you are released within two years, usually up there. You're still counted as being a resident of Wapan, a citizen of Wapan for all 10 years till the next census, which is nuts, you know. So yeah, a lot of states are, are uh, changing that law. Great. All right, and these are gonna jump around a little bit. I'm just kind of taking them as, as they come in. So uh, the next question is from Kenneth. How do we get around the problem of legislative leaders uh, bullying legislators of their party to tow the party line? Well, this is one of the problems with gerrymandering uh, because they've created safe districts and if someone uh, is in that uh, safe district but wants to disobey the party line, the legislative leader can say, you know, if you want to go be brave and vote your conscience, go ahead, but you're going to lose your job because I'm going to primary you. I'm going to run someone to the right of you who will be my little toady or my little foot soldier. And I've got a lot of money here because the change of the campaign finance laws has brought me a lot more money as the leader of the party. Uh, in the legislature, so I'm going to throw this money and give this money to your opponent in the primary and you're going to be busted. So it is a real problem. And again, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. But I think people need to be able to look themselves in the mirror, who are our elected officials. And the happiest man in Wisconsin still to this day is Dale Schultz, because he was a Republican state senator who was told, you know, get in line or we're going to primary you. And he told Scott Fitzgerald basically to take a flying leap because uh, he voted, uh, Dale Schultz decided to vote against Act 10, decided to vote against the mining law, and uh, is happy as can be that he voted his conscience and can look at him, himself in the mirror. So we need to make the case to elected officials, and there are good Republicans uh, in the legislature, uh, and appeal to them uh, as a matter of conscience. You know, what's most important to you, doing what's right or just staying in this seat forever? And, and I think, uh, you know, there have been people retiring from the legislature uh, because it may not be the most fun place to work. I don't know why people would want to be there myself. But yeah, I mean, have some integrity and, and vote your conscience like Jeff Mursaw did. And even if the speaker is against you. And so if you're well liked in your community too, your community may support you even if the other person is getting more money than you are. So how do we know what each of our representatives uh, believe about this issue, um, you know, on the whole? So we can call our own legislators, but is there a place where we can find out which legislators support uh, fair maps and which ones do not? Well, Common Cause is doing a survey of candidates who are uh, running for office and where they stand on this issue. So you could uh, go to Common Cause's webpage and see uh, if the, uh, they have candidates that uh, have already come on board. You also can just call up your legislator if they're an incumbent and say, you know, where did you stand on this bill to uh, give us independent nonpartisan redistricting? Uh, the one that Todd Novak and Jeff Mursaw and the other uh, three Republicans co-sponsored, were you with them or not? Uh, those are the only five Republicans who voted for it. So if, if, if your legislator isn't one of those five and they're a Republican, you know they weren't in favor of it in the assembly anyway. Great. All right, here's a good question um, that I also uh, am anxious to hear your answer, answer to. Um, so what is the narrative used to defend gerrymandering? What is the argument for keeping the maps the way that they are? Well, Robin Voss said, uh, you know, we're elected to uh, draw the maps ourselves, that it's in the Constitution, and that it would be unconstitutional to let the Legislative Reference Bureau do it. That's not true. Uh, you know, Robin Voss didn't draw the maps last time. Uh, Oklahoma political scientists drew the maps, for God's sakes. And so it wasn't like he was there with his, uh, you know, Sharpie drawing the maps himself. Uh, under the Iowa model, the legislature still would vote on the maps. That's their constitutional duty. We're not taking their constitutional duty away. So that's their argument number one, which is invalid. Their argument number two, which, which is arrogance, which is what Robin Voss said is, look, we know better than some uh, uh, non-elected bureaucrat does about, you know, how to draw a map in Wisconsin. Well. 
The nice thing about the Iowa model is it gives real specific criteria to the Legislative Reference Bureau uh, about what they can and cannot do. They can't use the political demographic data that I talked about. They've got to keep local district boundaries and local county boundaries and natural boundaries the same. They can't draw funky maps like you showed in your video that squiggle all over the place. And so uh, that is just a perfectly uh, sensible and rational model for how to do nonpartisan redistricting. And, you know, it takes the political motive out of the hands of the politicians who have a real conflict of interest when they're drawing the maps. Yeah, absolutely. All right, next question. Uh, what's happening with the Supreme Court case right now? Um, my understanding is that now it's sort of up to the state legislature, but is there anything happening on the um, on the legal side of, of things at this point? No, the Wisconsin case that was called the Whitford case is dead. Uh, so once the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in that North Carolina and Maryland case that it's incompatible with democratic principles, but we're not going to do a blessed thing about it, uh, the, uh, the plaintiffs... Uh, in Wisconsin realized that they had no leg to stand on and they withdraw the, withdrew their suit because they knew that the federal court would have to uphold the U.S. Supreme Court's decision and would have thrown the, uh, the case out anyway. That's how our system works, unfortunately. Uh, and so uh, there was no judicial option once the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in those two cases that every federal courthouse door is locked and then we're out of business. Mm -hmm. So what happens moving forward if the legislature does end up drawing gerrymandered districts once again? Can Evers veto their, uh, the maps that they draw? It's a good question because there was a theory floating around the Capitol, a rumor floating around the Capitol a while back that Republicans wanted to ace Evers out of his veto wanted to take the veto pen out of his hand. They were going to do something called a, a, a joint resolution which isn't a bill, it's just a resolution uh, of, uh, in favor of the maps that they were drawing and rigging, uh, and then uh, deprive Evers of the opportunity to veto it because joint resolutions don't go to his desk. I don't think that's likely to happen. I mean, that's a strategy they could use, but I think the Republicans think uh, they're gonna rig the maps, they're gonna let Evers veto the maps, uh, and then they're gonna race to the Wisconsin Supreme Court where they have a 4-3 conservative majority and look to the Wisconsin Supreme Court to rubber stamp those maps. Now, there are, uh, are several good uh, progressive pro-democracy lawyers in Wisconsin uh, who are trying to figure out how to stop that from happening and how to get this into federal court, even though the Roberts Court said, don't bring your cases here. So there are ways that the uh, lawyers are, are thinking uh, to get back into federal court and just say procedurally, there was something wrong with the maps or on racial discrimination grounds, uh, they certainly can get to federal uh, court, even the U.S. Supreme Court allows uh, redistricting gerryman racial gerrymandering cases to go forward. So there'll be an opportunity for the lawyers to try to race into federal court on the theory that they've got a better shot uh, in federal court. Now, there is a possibility that even the conservative Wisconsin Supreme Court, which is only going to have a one-person majority, may not rubber stamp what the legislators are doing because Brian Hagedorn of all people who was uh, a recently elected very conservative justice to the Wisconsin Supreme Court has showed uh, an independent streak on a couple cases including the voter purge case and the safer at home case that he doesn't uh, move in certainly in lockstep with his uh, more doctrinaire um, conservative justices so there's a possibility that you know he would uh, see the light on this issue. I'm not going to discount that possibility. But the odds are Republicans may get their way again if we don't mount enough pressure here coming toward election day on whoever's running for office to, uh, to make sure that those folks vote for an unrigged map. And because the Republicans in the legislature are going to have to approve this map that boss, I guarantee you, is going to rig. And if we get enough Republicans to agree that they're not going to vote for that rigged map, uh, then uh, we might be able to stop it in its tracks. But realistically, I think we're probably two to four years away. So that leads into another question that I see coming up in the chat, and that's about the recent development that uh, last month Governor Evers introduced the People's Maps Commission. Can you speak a little bit about that process and the possibility of 
using that as an alternative to get uh, to get fair maps in Wisconsin. Yeah, uh, I'm very glad that the governor has done that. The People's Maps Commission, he just appointed three judges to head it and to appoint members to it and to take testimony around the state. Uh, this is going to be an advisory thing, though. I don't want to get your hopes up that the People's Maps Commission is actually going to be able to draw maps that then the legislature is going to implement. That's unlikely to happen. But they will be able to illustrate that, you know, here's a fair map. What we're drawing here at the People's Maps Commission, this is what a fair map would look like. And look at these rigged maps that the Republicans have brought forward. There's a better way to do it. And we're doing it a better way along the Iowa model. And this is the map that we came up with. And it doesn't have those funky squiggly districts. It's not cramming Democrats into tiny districts like they did in Racine and Kenosha, like your video showed. And so uh, I think it will be more of a, another public education effort, actually, uh, sponsored by the governor. Uh, and, and I hope it will do what you're doing with the Wisconsin Farmers Union in this video in this town hall is just to wake people up to how rigged the maps are and how we can have easily a much better, more sensible, more uh, pro-democracy way to to uh, construct uh, a process for giving us nonpartisan redistricting. Sure, certainly will help to have proof of how it can be done and should be done as a comparison, uh, because it's pretty hard to uh, to claim that it, it can't be done fairly when it's right there in front of us. Right. So. Um, all right, we have time for a couple more questions, but a few people are starting to get antsy about some action steps, so I don't want to um, I don't want to miss that opportunity. Uh, but maybe we'll take one more question here. Um, what has been the impact of the county-based fair maps resolutions? Have you seen greater public awareness of the need for fair maps, greater pressure on state legislators, or both as a result of county resolutions? Yeah, I think this has just been really dramatic. Uh, you know, as Tommy said, I've been driving all over the state over the last few years, carrying this huge cardboard uh, map of Wisconsin and the counties, and there, it just got increasingly uh, filled in with counties that had, had passed this resolution. And I think it was just uh, uh, so obvious to uh, county board members and citizens in every county that, look, this mass movement is catching fire. Uh, there's something really important here. And if we really want to respond to the wishes of the people, uh, we better get on board. So I think that's, uh, that's how this has happened. And most of those 51 counties, listen, they've come on board just in the last two years. This thing is, is really sweeping the state. Yeah, we've certainly been hearing a, a lot more noise about it lately as well. And, um, and of course, this has been a priority for Farmers Union and several organizations for a long time. But it does seem like there's a moment here where we're starting to really uh, pick up on the momentum and, and get this issue before uh, more people across the state. So that's, uh, that's good to see. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. I apologize to anybody who didn't have a question answered. We can do our best to follow up with you um, since we did run out of time and there are a couple of questions still left in the chat um, or in the, in the Q&A. Um, also in the chat box, it looks like um, Carlene has shared a few resources, uh, ways that folks can get involved, volunteering as part of a local Fair Maps team. So go ahead and click on those links and we'll also send out some resources after this call um, so that everybody knows uh, how you can get involved. So uh, we do have a couple of action steps that we want to share with you right now. Um, let me just go ahead and pull them up so, um, so I can give you a, a bit of a visual here. All right, great. Can I have a thumbs up from the panelists if you can see the slides? All right, great. Um, so this is, is such an important issue. I really appreciate seeing all of the engagement uh, in the chat. And um, this is an opportunity for us to ask each of you to take at least one of the following actions to support the movement for Fair Maps. So these are some suggested action steps. There's a lot that you can do, uh, but it's really important that everybody on this call does at least one thing. I see right now we have 140 active participants. So if we can get everybody to uh, make the same phone call at the same time or, or take a coordinated action, that will really help build on that momentum and, and help propel this issue forward. So I'm gonna share a few of the action steps that we have prepared for you. And we will also be following up 
with an email later this week to let you know what you can do to get involved. So the first thing you can do, it's a pretty easy one that Matt already mentioned, um, take the Fair Maps Voter Pledge. So this is a way that you can signal your support for Fair Maps uh, online through the Wisconsin Fair Maps Coalition and just demonstrate the people of Wisconsin really want and are ready for nonpartisan redistricting. So the pledge has fairly simple language. It states, I believe that Wisconsin should have a level playing field and fair elections. That's why I pledge to vote only for candidates who promise to support fair maps legislation, a fair redrawing in 2021, and who will vote to ban partisan gerrymandering. So you should all see the link to find this pledge on the screen, but again, we will also be sending this out, uh, all of the action steps with the appropriate links in an email later this week. So the second thing you can do is to call your state legislators and any candidates running for state senate or assembly and ask them if they support nonpartisan redistricting. This is a, also an opportunity for you to vote, uh, voice your support for the People's Maps Commission as an alternative to what we anticipate will be uh, gerrymandered maps that are presented by the legislature. And also ask your existing members of the legislature and any candidates to take the legislator or candidate pledge to vote for fair maps. So you as an individual can take the voter pledge. You can also call your legislators and candidates and ask them to take the pledge as well. So if you do not already know who represents you in the state legislature, you can click on this link when we send it out in an email and find that information. You can also find a list of everybody who is running for office in your area and you can call them as well and ask them to support nonpartisan redistricting. So this is really important. We wanna generate a lot of phone calls into these offices as a result of this video. So I just wanted to take a second to ask everybody who is willing to make one of these calls to just type into the chat box, I commit to make this call, or just write the words I commit so that we can see how many people are going to tomorrow, later this week, pick up the phone and start actually taking action on this issue. So please add that to the chat if you're willing to make these calls. All right, I'm seeing the chat box fill up. So thank you all so much for committing to, to make these phone calls. All right, the third thing that you can do is to get involved at the local level. So step one is to find out if your county has already passed a fair maps resolution or referendum. There are 52 counties that have already supported fair maps in some way. Uh, and there's an opportunity that we'll be able to add eight more in November. So here's a list of counties that have a referendum on the November ballot. We have Brown, Crawford, Door, Dunn, Iowa, Jefferson, Kenosha, and Rusk counties. So if anyone on the line lives in any of these counties, you will have an opportunity to vote for fair maps uh, via referendum on your November ballot. So uh, please do what you can to uh, engage with other voters in your area and make sure that this is, uh, this is something that passes in those counties uh, in just a few months. So I also wanted to give an opportunity for uh, Rachel Henderson, who's the president of our Wisconsin Farmers Union Dunn County chapter, to share a little bit about the work that the chapter is doing to organize locally around fair maps in Dunn County. And this is really an example of something that that anyone can do locally, whether it's through a Farmers Union chapter or some of the action teams through the Wisconsin Fair Maps Coalition. Um, so Rachel, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you to share a little bit of the work that you're doing. Yeah, great. Thanks, Bobby, and thanks everyone for participating tonight. Um, this is really exciting. So I've had the opportunity this spring and summer to be part of, um, or to work with a group of electoral organizing uh, team at Wisconsin Farmers Union. And um, we've been hosting some virtual house meetings with our Dunn County Farmers Union members. Um, and I'm really excited that folks here in Dunn County are, are really getting behind um, some, doing some action on fair maps. So we are lucky enough to have um, this on our, uh, this referendum on our ballots this November. Um, and we are going to be doing some training on uh, deep canvassing. So we are have a team that's, that's committing to some online trainings right now for deep canvassing. And we're going to be doing phone-based deep canvassing around the issue of fair maps in particular. Um, I'm sure this is true all over the state, but in Dunn County, we have, um, we have a lot of 
parts of rural Dunn County that are that are so heavily gerrymandered that it's very very obvious to a lot of folks here um, that they know that they don't vote the same way as their neighbors um, that they don't vote for the same representatives as their neighbors or the other people in their school districts so I think we really have an opportunity to reach some voters on an issue that um, hopefully kind of gets around the, the partisan divide. You know, Dunn County is a really heavily divided area. And I think being able to talk to people about fair maps is gonna give us the opportunity to get into some conversations about what is going on um, in our county without uh, having to dive into issues that, um, that might spark more divisive, um, heated discussion. So we're really excited about this. Like I said, we have a small team right now that's preparing to do this. If there are folks on here from Dunn County um, who want to know more about it, you, I will put my email address in the chat box um, so that you can get in touch with me um, and you can join our team. Um, or as has been shared throughout this presentation, I think there's quite a lot going on in, in other counties as well. So thanks so much, Bobby. Um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity with Congress Union. Great, thanks so much, Rachel, for sharing the local organizing that you're doing in Dunn County. And, um, and folks, if you live in the area and you're interested in getting involved, please contact Rachel. Um, you, uh, it's pretty easy to become a Wisconsin Farmers Union member. If you are not already, you can go to our website. Uh, and this is the type of work that we're seeing in counties all around the state. Um, county chapters are taking up issues that are important to the, the statewide organization, but that have this local impact. Um, so if you're not already a Farmers Union member, I encourage you to join and to get involved in Fair Maps uh, organizing and the organizing that we do on all types of other issues all around the state. So just had to take the opportunity for a, a quick membership uh, plug and to highlight some of the great work that's happening. So thanks for that, Rachel. All right, so the three things that you can do are to take the voter pledge, to contact your elected officials and candidates, and to get involved at the local level. The local organizing is so important. There are also a couple of ways that you can continue to engage on this issue. Um, so one thing that you can do is to post on social media. Uh, Tommy will be sharing this short video and it will be uploaded to YouTube as soon as the presentation ends. So you can share the video on social media. We'll also have a recording of this full presentation available so you can share the entire presentation. You can voice your support for the People's Maps Commission on social media uh, to make sure that people know that there is an alternative available. Um, and in a couple of other ways that you can just stay plugged into all the work that's going on. First is to sign up for the Fair Maps Coalition newsletter. We send a bi-weekly newsletter uh, with updates on the work that's going on and ways that you can plug in. So we will send a link to sign up for the newsletter in our follow-up email. And of course, also continue to stay connected with Wisconsin Farmers Union. Um, we are working on this issue along with a lot of other groups and several other issues. So please follow us on social media, consider becoming a member. You can check out our new Fair Maps page on the website as well. Um, and also take a look at some of the other work that we're doing um, around the state. So um, just to, to wrap up the presentation, it looks like we're just about 8.30. Um, as a reminder, look out for the follow-up email from Tommy uh, that has links and action steps that you can all take. Um, be sure to share this information far and wide. And just everybody, please take at least one action moving forward from today to support Fair Maps. Because it's, you know, we're big believers in democracy, but it's not enough to just simply believe in democracy, we all need to actively participate in it. And this is a really good way that you can do that, uh, that will have long term impact. So that concludes our presentation. And thank you so much again to Matt Rothschild from the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign for joining as our guest speaker. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And we look forward to connecting with you soon. Have a good night.